Well, today we're going to uh, continue our studies in Luke, so I invite you to open up your Bible to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. You know, we like stories that have big turnarounds, right? For those of you who are sports fans, and I know not all of you are, but a few of you are, uh, you know, earlier this year, about three months ago, we had the biggest reversal in Super Bowl history. Those of you who remember watching the New England Patriots and the Atlanta Falcons, and at the end of the first half, I mean, the Falcons were blowing away, you know, the New England Patriots. It was like 28 to 3 or something, and everybody pretty much just wrote them off. It was just a done deal. It was going to be the most boring Super Bowl in history. And wow, you know, you never say never about the New England Patriots, right? They came back. They ended up winning that game. It was the greatest reversal in Super Bowl history. Well, today we're going to look at another great reversal. I have to tell you that today's passage, Luke 16, 19 to 31, we come to a difficult passage. And I'm reminded to remind you that here at Church Requel, we teach the whole Bible. We don't cherry pick what we like and what we don't like. We're reminded today especially that God's thoughts are not our thoughts, that God's ways are not our ways. In fact, in many respects, we see God, if we are honest about it, as a God of opposites. Stop and think about it. He's, we, we read in Scripture that the first will be last, and the last will be first. We read that the least among us will be the greatest, and the greatest will be the least among us. We read that whoever wants to, to save his life must lose it. Whoever loses his life will save it, right? I mean, these are, these are all opposites. Today we come to another great reversal. It is the parable, a very famous parable, but one, frankly, that most pulpits don't talk a lot about, the rich man and the beggar. But it is uh, next up in our list, so we're going to take a look at it. We're going to learn, I hope, six lessons from the rich man and the beggar. And if you haven't read this uh, parable in a while, let me just kind of remind you about what happens. There is a unnamed rich man. I, I find that interesting, that all the way through the parable, the rich man is only ever described as the rich man. He never has a name. He's unnamed. And uh, at the place of the rich man, there's also a beggar. The beggar has a name. His name is Lazarus. And the beggar has no food and is hungry and uh, hopes just for the crumbs off of the rich man's table. The rich man lives in luxury, he wears fine clothes, but then comes the great reversal. Both die, and the poor man, the beggar, goes to paradise, he goes to heaven, and the rich man, he goes to Hades or to hell, and we uh, read that there's this uh, great desire on the part of the rich man for Lazarus, the poor man, to come and just dip his finger in water just to cool his tongue. And Jesus is telling this story about this great reversal. Now, my question is, when we come to this, what should we take away from it? So as I have studied this and as I have thought about it and prayed about it, I came up with six lessons from the rich man and the beggar. So let's go through them today and see how our lives might be enriched because of this parable. Lesson number one, life is not equitable, but God in me wants me to be the difference. That's a mouthful, but let me say that again. Life is not equitable. Life, in other words, is not fair. But God in me, His Holy Spirit in me, He, he wants me to be the difference in this inequitable life that we live in. And we see this inequity right at the very basis of this parable in Luke 16, 19 to 21. There's a rich man, and there is at his gate laid a beggar. This beggar is someone who apparently is infirmed, so not only does he not have money, he doesn't have health, he is just getting by day to day, and there is a rich man who has the opportunity to take care of the poor man, and apparently he does not do that. So right at the very beginning of this parable, Jesus tells us something that, that we need to remember, 
And that is that life itself is not fair. There has never been equity in life. There's never been an equal treatment of everybody in life. There is always among us the rich, and there always is among us the poor. In fact, at one point, Jesus actually says, you will always have the poor among you. Now, stop and think about that. Here is the Son of God who has the ability to do uh, unknown amount of miracles, and yet He doesn't save everybody. He doesn't give wealth to everybody. He doesn't heal everybody. But even though Jesus is no longer here personally, He is among each of us in spirit, right? We believe that as uh, God saves us, he doesn't save us just to save us. He, he comes into us. His spirit joins our spirit. And in the people of God, as Christians, we become literally the hands and the feet of Jesus. So life itself is not fair, but God expects us to do everything that we can do in this world while we are here to make a difference in the world. The next time you say to yourself, well, man, that's not fair, you should be saying to yourself, so what is it that God would expect me to do about it? And that's exactly the opposite of what we tend to do, right? We tend to say, God, life is not fair. Why is life not fair? Why are you not making this fair? There's a famous song that's out. In fact, it's in our playlist every uh, Sunday when you come in. Uh, That's why God created you. That's why God created me. He tells us that uh, life is not fair, but he expects us to make a difference. And in fact, in this parable, Jesus tells us that there's going to come a time of judgment and that one of the keys to his judgment will be what we have done or in many of our cases failed to do in his name to make a difference in this unfair world. In this story, we have a rich man who failed to make a difference in the life of the beggar. In fact, in another part of Scripture, Jesus goes so far as to say that whatever it is that we, as Christ followers, have done to others in his name, we actually have done to him. Or what we have failed to do for others in his name. We have failed to do to him. In other words, to Jesus, this life that we live as Christ followers is very personal to him. We don't like to think of it that way, but it's true. He says in Matthew 25, 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Or in another part of that, I was hungry and you failed to give me something to eat. So today, we we see this parable, but this parable is really the outcome of that judgment. This rich man failed to take care of the beggar at his doorstep. Now, whenever we read the words rich in Scripture, every single one of us immediately put a disclaimer on this that, well, that rich guy should have done that. That rich guy should have taken care. Those rich, man, those rich people, they are terrible without ever realizing that we're among the richest people who have ever lived. The poorest among us are better off than the richest in the past. So let's never give ourselves a pass whenever it comes to rich. All of us have opportunity to help other people, whether it's with money or with food or whatever way the Spirit of God would lead us. Don't dismiss this because we think that we are not rich. The poorest among us are the wealthiest. So the very first uh, lesson that we learn here may be the one that you need to take home the most today, and that is, yes, life isn't fair. Life isn't equitable. But God wants me, he wants you to be the difference maker in this life. In fact, not only does he want that, he expects that of us. Have you ever stopped and think about the fact that if if this wasn't true, and God is an all-powerful God, and God could save us and does save us, why wouldn't he just immediately zap us up into heaven? Because there's really nothing left to do here. We're saved, so let's just go on to heaven. No, he leaves us here because he wants us to make a difference. Now, let's go on to lesson number two, because 
I'm going to contradict one thing that I said in lesson number one. I said that life is not equal. Life is not equitable. Do you remember me saying that? But there is one place, one way in which every single man, woman, and child who has ever been born is equal, and that is this, death. We're all equal when it comes to death. Notice this in verse 22. There was a time when the beggar died, and then we see later the rich man also died and was buried. In other words, it didn't matter that one was rich and the other was poor. It didn't matter that one maybe had been in better health and the other was in poor health. It didn't matter that one had great opportunities and the other didn't. When it comes to this issue of death, every person who has ever lived has either died already or will die. Death is never treated in Scripture as the end. It's always treated in Scripture as the transition. The transition from this life to the next life. And part of that transition includes a judgment that is based on this life. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 tells us that people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. And I'm here to tell you that that includes all of us. It doesn't matter whether we're Christ followers or not. Now, this is a sobering thought, sobering that you and I would be judged based on how I have lived in this life. And, you know, a lot of times we as Christ followers like to just think, well, we get a pass because we're Christians, but that's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture does teach us that there will be rewards based on how we have lived, that there will be a judgment based on how we have lived. And it's especially when we recognize that this judgment is not based on a curved scale. Back when I went to college, and Brandy, you were still a teacher in math I, in college. I imagine this is still somewhat true. There's, there's a, sometimes a curve, right? That, you know, so many people have to get A's, so many people have to get B's, so many people have to get C's. And so, you know, even if you didn't do particularly well on the test, if you did better than the other people, you at least got a better grade or maybe a passing grade. But <clears throat> we find that when we come to this issue of God's judgment, that it's not based on a curved scale. Our judgment, our comparison, is never the way we like to make it. Our comparison, the way we like to think about it, is how we compare to somebody else. And we all can find somebody else to whom we compare more favorably. But there's only one comparison that the Bible ever gives us in terms of what our expectation is. I don't know if you know this or not. What is your expectation? Our comparison is always God's expectation. And Jesus himself gives it to us in his famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. And here is the expectation. Are you ready for it? Be perfect. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, which of you here could, you know, Raise your hand with great boldness and say, I, I pass that test. Not a single person, including yours truly. Nobody passes that test. And so this lesson becomes especially sobering when we take a look at lesson number three. And that is that in this parable, Jesus describes the reality of hell. Oh, man. This, is, this, sermon, this Memorial Day sermon has turned especially sobering, has it not? Luke 19, uh, 16, verse 23, this rich man now is talking, and he even says, Jesus tells us where he is. He says, in Hades, which is another word for hell, where he was in torment, he says, have pity on me, send Lazarus to cool my tongue, I am in agony in this fire. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't particularly like reading this, I especially don't like preaching this, we are very quick in our minds to dismiss the reality of hell. We do not like to talk about hell. Preachers do not like to preach about hell, at least not very much anymore, it seems to me. However, if 
we are in this pulpit, and we are teaching God's Word, and we have an obligation to teach the whole of Scripture, then we have to take a step back when we come to this parable and realize that when it comes to the Gospels, that there's no person in the Bible who talks more about hell than Jesus himself. Now, this is interesting because one would believe that Jesus, as the Son of God, as part of the Creator God, would know about the reality of hell or not. And so, if He speaks more about hell than anyone else, then we need, I think, to put our antenna up and say, hey, what is it that He's saying here? And is it as bad as what some people have made it out to be? Well, we don't have to look to see what other people say. We just look to see what Jesus says here. How does he describe this place? He describes it as a place of torment. He describes it as a place where the person in it wants pity. He describes it as a place where the, the rich man, now the beggar, is begging for just a drop of water to cool his tongue. He describes this, again, very descriptive language, a place of agony. He describes this as a place of fire. What need do I have or any preacher have to add to this list? This is a horrible place. This is a horrible description. And not a single one of us should ever go there. Now, at this point in our heads, at least at this point in my preparation in my head, I'll just admit to you, we have the risk of what I call the great deception. And the great deception is this, that God would never do this to us. The great deception plays out in our head that God is a God of love and that a God of love could never create a hell and that if he did, he would certainly never send me there or anybody that I know or anybody that I love. But we have to remember that it is the Son of God who is telling this story. We have to remember that it is the rich man in this story who's actually having a conversation with Abraham, who is the father of the Jewish faith and, by extension, the father also of the Christian faith. And nowhere in this discussion do we see the rich man in this horrible place say, Hell is not fair. We don't see any place where he says, this is not just. And we ignore this truth to our own peril. So we have to then ask ourselves the question, well, then why was the rich man there? And that leads us to lesson number four, and that is that the life to come, whether in heaven or in hell, that the life to come is the great equalizer. Be careful about what you wish for when you say that life is not fair, because the life to come itself is the great equalizer. Verse 25 says this, Abraham is speaking to the rich man now in agony. He says, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. You see the great turnaround? You see the great equalizer? And this brings us back to our first point, that God has placed us here on this earth for a reason. And when you look around and you see the great injustices and the great unfairnesses and the great needs, and you wonder why it is that God does not do something about it, remember, He did do something. He created you. And you have a purpose. You have a reason for being. If you call yourself a Christ follower, you are to be available. You are to be usable for God's purposes and ultimately for His glory. So ultimately, when it comes to this issue of the great equalizer of the future of the next life, ultimately God's judgment upon every one of us is going to be this, how usable have I been? That's what the judgment is all about, how usable have I been? 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 17, we read this, that God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked. So in other words, you see, it's for all. For there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. So think of this as God's evaluation on your usability for him in eternity. That this time, this brief moment of time, this just goes by like this period of time that we have here on earth is really only a testing ground, an opportunity for us to prepare to serve God for all of eternity. So the question is, do we remember that God has a purpose for us? Do I remember that God has a reason for me being here that goes beyond me simply being saved and being part of the Christian faith and getting a pass, a ticket to heaven? No, God has a reason for me. He has a reason for you. And so regularly, you and I, we need to be reminded of this truth because it doesn't naturally come to mind. What naturally comes to mind is taking care of me, taking care of you. Our selfishness. That's why we need this lesson number five, and that is this, that the Word of God is my great reminder about the great reversal to come. The Word of God is my great reminder. The Word of God is your great reminder about the great reversal. We read in this passage, it's interesting that the passage doesn't stop before now. The rich man, once he realizes that he cannot save himself, he now has a desire to save his brothers. So he wants to send a private, personally delivered message to his brothers. He wants to go back as a dead man rising again to warn them, to scare them, to remind them so that they may not suffer the same fate that he has. But what was Abraham's response to that request? He says this, Your brothers, they have Moses and the prophets. Now, whenever you read in the New Testament that they have Moses and the prophets, what they're really talking about is the Old Testament. They're talking about Scripture. That's another way of saying the Bible. They have the Bible. That the Bible is a great reminder. In verse 31, he says, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, They will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. We make big movies, some of them bigger budgets than others. Uh, We like to watch movies. We like to watch TV shows. I don't know what the fascination is, but, you know, The Walking Dead, people coming back to life, the zombies, right? Right? And Jesus is saying through this parable that even if you saw a real-life zombie, that it wouldn't be a powerful a message, as powerful a reminder as what the Word of God is that you carry around with you, either on your phone or in paper. That the greatest opportunity that you and I have to be reminded about the great judgment to come And our responsibility to live our lives here on earth, to live out our purpose and to take care of the needs that God brings to our mind, that our reminder is in Scripture. So if you're not in Scripture, if you're not reading the Bible, if you're not listening to it, if your mind is not centered around what this book has to say, then you are missing out. Stop and think about the fact that you do have an enemy of your soul and that he will do everything he can to distract you from the powerful word of God. This gives us some idea just how dramatic, how powerful this word of God is. And it gives us also some idea of just how foolish we are if we ignore it, which we all do from time to time. Now, this is pretty discouraging so far. Anybody else, to say, anybody else say, man, I am so glad that I came to church requel on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I don't know about you, but this is not my favorite uh, sermon that I have ever preached. But we come to point number six, and I, I hope that if I've done as good a job as I need to do as your pastor who loves you, 
who teaches faithfully what Scripture teaches, that now you're ready for number six, and that is this. What hope do I have? Jesus is my only hope. What hope do you have? Jesus is your only hope. I don't care how good a Christian you are. I don't care how faithful you are. We all mess up. We all don't do what we should do all the time. We could all put ourselves in this story, not in the person of Lazarus, but in the person of the rich man. Isn't it interesting, as I mentioned before, that the rich man never has a name? When Jesus is describing hell, in a lot of his uh, talks, he uses actually a word called Gehenna, which is the name for the waste area that's outside the city of Jerusalem. It's like a continuously burning pit where garbage is simply thrown where waste is taken care of and disposed of. And we come to this story of the rich man who lived very, very well, but never has a name. Why? Because at the end of days, no matter how rich he is, no matter how well he has done for himself, if he has never discovered and lived out his purpose in Christ, he's just another piece of garbage. And we don't name our garbage. We just throw it out because it's not usable. Our prayer of our life should be, God, help me to be usable to you. Another word for usability, another word for being set aside to be used by God is the word holy. Help me to be used by you in a way that pleases you. But I know that I cannot do this of my own self, that I can only do it through the power of Jesus and his spirit that lives inside of me. We have one more verse that I want to remind you of, also from Scripture. It comes from John chapter 5, verse 24. And it's Jesus speaking, and he says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has, present tense, has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. And when we say will not be judged, we mean that you pass the judgment. So that when it comes time to us standing before God and having failed the judgment, ultimately what God sees is not your failures, but he sees the success of his son. He doesn't see you as a loser. He sees the winner of his son. He sees his son's blood shed for you and shed for me. So when we go to the communion tables and when we come to church on Sunday and when we read our scripture and when we pray, part of our life should be, God, I have no life apart from you. I have no hope apart from you. If we stand outside the gate of heaven at the judgment seat of Christ and and we're asked the question by God, why should I let you into my heaven? The only reason that any of us can ever give is because of the Son of God, because of what Jesus has done for me and what he has done for you. Because we count on this promise We count on what Jesus says, that we have heard his word, that we believe him, and that we believe him who sent him. We believe God the Father. And that because of that, we don't receive eternal life someday. We have eternal life now. Because of that, as a thank you to God and in obedience to God, it is my desire every single day, and I hope, your desire every single day to do everything that you can to please our Heavenly Father, to be the difference in this world that we find ourselves in.